on air. Welcome to Picks the Fun Do Roundtable in June. We've been averaging about one a month of these. We've got a bunch of people here today. We got Adam. We got, why don't you raise your hands because I don't have names. Adam. We've got Alex. Or just a picture. <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe that was just a picture of Alex. We've got Ed. <laughs> Pascal. <laughs> Pascal. <laughs> He's we, German. It's just Steve uh, White. Uh, we'll talk about Steve in a minute. New member. Yazan is the, uh, the, the the new prince symbol, apparently. <laughs> the, the artist formerly known as Yazan. The artist formerly known as the talking symbol. Due, okay. due to copyright issues. Uh, production values. Come on. Come on. All right. Uh, so let's actually, I'm just, uh, a couple things to talk about. I want to talk about Steve in a minute because he's new. First of all, I'm going to share my screen somewhere here. Share. Share screen. Wait a minute before I do that. Let me prep my screen. Nope, not that one. Um, and we want to talk quickly about the pixel fondue. Whoops, is that the right one? That's not the right one. One second. Production values, like I was saying. Maybe this is now. Um, so we have the Lego contest. This yellow banner here at the top. We are shooting for. More entries to the Lego contest. We are sweetening the pot. Not only do you get to pick your teapot. This photo that looks like a 3D render, but we also are throwing in Slick 2, Holly Stein, and Adam has graciously agreed to throw in what? Which one? Dara, Kelvin? I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to sweeten this pot with with a full commercial license of Dara. That's that's a, a four hundred dollar value, folks. That's full right. you commercial here first. of Dara. That that's is right. basically everything Every plug-in I've ever made, makes. right there. Okay, game over. I'm, in, I'm entering this contest. All you got to do is enter. Mm -hmm. I think I might enter. I enter a previously win. made. Okay. No. To win. So the idea was we're finishing up July fourth. That's like five days, people. Get on there, download a Lego, get the Lego loader installed, download uh, Darth Maul and you know a Hobbit, and you know throw them together, see who wins. All right. So that's Lego battle. You will also notice at the top of the screen here we have a shop button now. Let's fix up on do. Press shop, and we go to the shop page, and we have all kinds of goodies here. Pretty much anything, any kit, asset pack, plug-in, uh, or training available for Bodo, we would like to get on our shop page. Now, Pixel Fondue is not selling these. Let me stress, Pixel Fondue is not selling these. We are linking to the pages of the people who are selling these. So, um, for instance, advanced character setup, one of the best plugins you can get for Moto. Click on this, you're gonna to go to the ACS page and you can uh, buy it right from there. So we're just aggregating everything available for Moto. So number one, if you have something that you would like to sell, send an email over to pixelfondue.com, uh, contact at pixelfondue.com with the Pixel Fondue store as a subject. We'll get a thumbnail, we'll get a link, we'll get a description. If you have a material asset pack or a polystein pack, we will uh, get that on there and uh, put it up on the site. Other thing I want to emphasize very clearly is we are not selling these, which means <laughs> don't send me an email like I just got five minutes ago before we even put the store up saying, I bought the Viz pack, why can't I download it? So I'm just gonna send you to Richard and then eventually I'm just going to like take Richard's thing off of here if I get 5,000 emails. So. We're trying to do a service to the community. I think it'll be great. You know, one-stop shop for all Pixel Fondue stuff. And the idea is, I think, you know, like, um, you know, Adam and and uh, William or some other people might get together and offer a bundle, right, Adam? Something like that. Could do. I have nothing to announce. But, nothing uh, to announce. Sure, but that's one good. of the ideas. Like, you know, we have a bunch of stuff here, so maybe you get Channel Chimp plus uh, Hatchet Collection or something like that. Um, and there. If you offer training, we'll put that on here as well. So that's the Pixel Fun View shop page, and that is live now. So that is good. Uh, let me stop sharing, go back to uh, live broadcast. So Steve White, um, Steve, long time free user, like what, talking 90s here, right? Yeah, like uh, probably, probably started in 99. 99. Uh, yeah, so. Animation Master, I think, was my first actual package. Hash Animation Master. I haven't heard yeah. of that mentioned in a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's actually, you know, if you do animation, 
it was actually not a bad program to use. It actually that has a, features a, that I still could even get in Lightwave today, you know, or even Moto. Um, that had a great reputation. Yeah, but, um, you know, it works with uh, patches. It doesn't actually work with polygons, except at render time. Um, so, you know, uh, you get models that are just pinches and creases everywhere, and, uh, you know, right. I'm not sure how far they've moved in all these years, but, um, uh, yeah, it was it was good for a good for beginning package, but um, and then I went into Lightwave, um, and I actually got into Moto around 401, uh, but and I was with it for a few versions, but it never really clicked with me. Um, you know, it just it just for whatever reason it just didn't uh -huh. get me until then. I came back at 901, and then I just kind of fell in love with it. Honestly, you know, because. Um, you know, a lot of my work is modeling, so, uh, you know, obviously, Moto, that is one of its strengths, so, um, you know, I've just been with this, so. So, how many Lightwave users out there, are you still involved with the Lightwave community? How many Lightwave users out there are still contemplating the, the switch to Moto after 12 years? <laughs> there's um, got to be a lot. Well, you know, there's still some people that are sort of have a foot in both both communities. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how many users are still kind of comp contemplating it, but I just see in general a lot of people just looking, you know, it's been like three years almost now since their last release, so um, I, I do see a lot of people just kind of looking elsewhere, and I'm sure Moto is one of the things they look at. You know, Lightwave users, if you happen to watch this, if you're interested, maybe we can do a Pixel Fondue Lightwave to Moto transition guide and uh, get you guys transitioned over. I'm a Lightwave user myself from back in the day, back in the Back in the old, before Steve even, um, it was my main package for a long time before I had switched to Maya around the turn of the turn of the millennium, and then eventually back to Moto. Um, but anyway, anything else, Steve? You ZBrush? You doing some ZBrush work? You doing some substance yeah. work? Yep, uh, do a lot of work in ZBrush. Um, I've just in the last few years gotten into substance and just find it incredible. It just uh, you know, it's one of the few packages that really just still excite me, you know, like, you know, just with the, you know, the changes they make and just with some of the, you know, just how much you, how versatile of a tool it is, you know, for using and, you know, if you want to use high res meshes or you know, if you're doing stuff for game work, um, you know, just, it's just a great all around package. So. Right. Right. Um, and so Steve, that, you, your, uh, your name is not uh, Steve on the forum, right? You're pretty prolific on the, on the Foundry forum. Yeah, um, people, people, a lot of people probably know me as, I, I go, I used to go by the name, well, I go by the name H.R. Geiger, for, you know, because he was a big inspiration for me for a, lot, a long time. You so know, you're, like, you're a big uh, fan of wait, the Wait, that's you? Yes, yes, I am, I am <laughs> H.R. Geiger on the forum. Oh, my gosh. Okay, <laughs> now it all makes sense, Steve. <laughs> Delete. You just deleted your entire Pixel Fondue account. You just, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, That's I've weird. actually been thinking about changing that because uh, you know, for a while, for me, that was just sort of a tribute name. You know, I just like I, it was such a fan. You know, of Aliens and, and and his, you know, a lot of his artwork, and and now it just seems like okay, you're a guy using another artist's name. You know, so <laughs> yeah, I've actually just been thinking about uh, kind of deleting that uh, that name altogether. Honestly, yeah. Yeah, forums are, you know, once you start, I don't well, know, I'm, I'm a fan of using your... You know, <laughs> if uh, it's something I can take after, no, I'm just, uh, <laughs> that's probably just, I just, probably just better if I just uh, go to my other, my, my real name, so. All right. Let's, uh, so that's Steve, so look for some, he's going to concentrate on some ZBrush and algorithmic uh, tutorials. If you're involved in the ZBrush community, bring them over to Pixel Fondue. We are trying to get involved in the ZBrush community as well as algorithmic. Um, obviously, we're very Moto centric right now, but as some, you know, we would really like to have be in the same have Moto and ZBrush and algorithmic and a lot of these sort of pipeline tools in the same brain space. And so, if you like watching our stuff and you're involved in ZBrush, you, you, you know, you, you can you know contact me for interest in making tutorials. And if you just want to promote, um, you know, it's a fun do over in the other forums in, in a way in a way that they just become aware of us. Uh, that would be great. Um, let's start. I don't know. We don't have a huge agenda today. There's been a new modal release we can talk about, a new ZBrush release we can talk about. Algorithmic had a new uh, release as well. I think maybe I'll just start on the far left. Uh, Adam, anything you want to talk about today in terms of new mechanical, mechanical color plugins or anything you've been working on? I saw you wearing an Oculus Rift headset earlier. Anything in the <laughs> VR area? Yeah, I got, I got way too, too much stuff going on right now, that's for sure. Um, 
and uh, some of them are collaborations with various people in this group right now. Um, uh, I guess the only thing uh, with regard to like mechanical color stuff is that Solo came out this week, which is a which is you know super simple one, mainly just for kind of uh, hiding. You know, it's like um, hide unselected basically, except it does several things at once in one button. It just kind of keeps things simple. Um, so if you want to, if you're like working on a big complex model, you got one thing you want to focus on, then it lets you do that really easily. Um, that also, should be mapped to a, that should be mapped to the Control One Pi menu, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, there, there's a lot of good stuff um, in it, and and thanks to the users. I mean, one of the reasons I do development the way I do, which is kind of get stuff out that's, to, for lack of a better term, half-assed. I kind of I kind of get it out there quickly because I want for people to use it and then feedback, and that's exactly what happened. As soon as I let it out, within 24 hours, I had tons of great feedback. And you know, 24 hours later, we had a much, much better, better plugin. So it does a lot of different things. It's compatible with external renderers. It lets you, you know, gives you Maya-like settings for whether you want it to uh, to stay in place versus recenter everything on the selected objects and hiding and showing components versus items and all sorts of stuff. So that's a, that's a pretty cool one. Very simple, but but gets the job done. And I'm uh, I just released a new thing called uh, called Noodles, which is for for Dara users only. And the idea with noodles is that basically there are all kinds of little scripts that I need all the time as I'm working, um, and they don't take me long to write. But you know, transferring them between my machines is annoying. So I put them into Dara so that I can have them on all my machines, and that means that you have them too if you have Dara. So um, they're just a little thing. So like one thing right now has to do with procedural modeling. A lot of times when you're doing procedural modeling, you're starting from a base mesh and using merge meshes to uh, to bring those together. That takes several steps to do. It's not hard. It's just a click. It's, it's a lot of click work. And so I made a one, uh, you know, one button that takes all the selected meshes and uses a merge meshes to put those together. And so that's in the noodles kit. I'm going to be adding more stuff to that. And then hopefully, you know, the idea with noodles is that over time. Um, some clear patterns will emerge, and maybe some of the stuff that's in that will get pulled out and put into other plugins that I can sell separately. Um, but uh, but for now, it's kind of just think of it as sort of an experimental bucket of stuff. So, so if you win the Lego contest, you get access to Noodles. You do, you do, and I mean I think the idea of just having Noodles in your toolbar is uh, that's that's reason enough, honestly, to buy Dara. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like that. All right. Uh, Alex, how are you feeling? You want to chat? I know Alex has had some, it's just recovering from a visit to the hospital. And first of all, nice to see you here. You know, if you are on the Slack forum or the uh, Slack channel for Moto uh, or Skype, you know, Alex is a fixture there and he's, um, he's got a, are you, are you bed rest right now? Is that a pillow behind you? Are you feeling better? No, that's 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 a comfy chair. <laughs> that's a comfy chair. All right, you're up and about. It was nice to see you. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm doing better. Uh, slowly, slowly getting back to being able to uh, join the workforce again. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Did you win Zelda? I know you're playing that in your downtime. Yeah, I think I've finished it like three times by now, or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any new? Uh, any new video game recommendations, send them Alex's way. <laughs> uh, anything else, Alex? How's it going over there in Germany? Uh, weather's great. Uh, sweating my ass off. Um, <laughs> uh, well, nothing, nothing really uh, great news over here. So uh, I'm just enjoying life and uh, getting back on my feet, really. I'm very happy to see you back on your feet. I know that's like um, nobody likes to go to the emergency room or be in surgery. And so fantastic. No. <laughs> and, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying that. I know you had mentioned it on, on Slack and, yeah, and no. people want to wish you wish you well. So, you know, the 3D community is small and it, it's a small world. In fact, I was, um, it's interesting. I was, Wow, well, I was. Uh, well, yeah, you know, it's a small world. So when some, if you if when somebody gets sick or something like that, people band together, and it's good to see. Um, so that's Alex. Ed, how you doing, man? Oh, caught me with one foot off the merry-go-round. I had myself unmuted. <laughs> I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'm just getting ready for uh, for a move cross country, so I don't have a whole lot going on. Um, uh, yeah. Tell us about your TV career. Everybody's interested. Oh yes, yeah, so I finished my last day uh, as a stand-in on uh, last Monday. So, um, or this past Monday. Uh, so it was a, it was a curb your enthusiasm, or just uh, standing in. So uh, now that that's over with, I should have a lot more time to just dedicate to Moto and 3D. And that's the whole reason 
why uh, you know I'm, I'm making the move. So uh -huh. as long as I stay in LA, I'm basically stuck to this job. So and so for aspi one. aspiring stand-ins, let us know. <laughs> like it's a tough job, right? This is not like you show up for half an hour and leave. Yeah, it's not it's not a difficult job at all, but uh, it's just time consuming. <laughs> you're, you're, you're there all the time. You always have to be on call when uh, the camera crew needs you. You just have to be you be there ready for them to set up lighting and blocking. You have to pay attention to what the actors do, and it's just uh, you just have to pay attention basically. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but don't get involved in it. <laughs> so, don't get involved. Unless you're, actor, uh, unless, unless you're right. an aspiring actor, then it's it's helpful. Yeah. yeah. All right. So so you're headed to Florida, and you're going to be back on track. Maybe getting some new Pixel Fondue uh, Mesh Fusion, and maybe some other stuff up soon. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, so I should be there by uh, July 20th because I'm driving out. I'm going to take my time driving. So, uh, yeah, I'm giving myself a nice long amount of time to get there. And, uh, and yeah, so I should be all set up and just working. I'm going to try to dedicate more, way more time to Pixel Fun do, So So William Vaughn is in Florida. How far away are you going to be from him? Uh, so I believe he's in Orlando. So I'm about three hours south of, of him. So if there's, if there's a Moto users group in, uh, in Florida, even if it's central, centrally located, we'll try to pull people in you know, try to get that going. Right, yeah, Orlando, in case you've never been to Disney World, is northern Florida, right? Yeah, it's like central, like uh, central. Or north central, yeah. It's, not, it's north it's of not Miami. Miami. Yeah. Right. No, no, Miami's yeah. far south, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Pascal, how's New York? How's that treating you? New York's good. I'm back freelancing because the company I was working with uh, went under. It's my, not my fault. No, oh, come on. Cop to yeah. it. What did you do? I did I just left, and <laughs> when I, I, I went back for, to France for a short trip. When I came back, there was nothing left. Oh, goodness. The owners and the, the whole thing went under. So such a such a great field we've all put ourselves into, huh? <laughs> I mean, this is not uncommon. This happens. But, uh, like, but this way, I was able. I worked uh, just uh, contributed to the Palestine uh, assets thing. Was just a lot of fun. I mean, I would encourage people to really check it out. I saw people on the forum saying, "I don't do character work, so I'm not interested." It's much, much more than character work. I mean, you can do so much with it. It's yeah, really screen great. sharing here. Pixel fondue shop. Scroll on down. The cool-looking uh, 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 steampunk guy here is Pascal Steampunk Collection, and that is not just characters, but yeah, you've got pipes, you've got tubes, yeah. you've got all kinds of stuff. Yeah, the, the piping is actually the most uh, useful. I mean, the other ones are for fun, but the, the piping is actually a great example of what you can do with the uh, polystyrene that's not character related and it's very useful. Yeah, the piping videos are really cool. Like, they all, all the pieces sort of fit together. They have a, yeah, I mean, you can just great. start, just hatch these things together really quickly. It's really great. So, so yeah, I'm going to promote this. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, if you, you know, a lot of the Pixel Fun members here, they've been creating videos um, on their spare time for everybody for, oh gosh, almost a year now, I think. And if you've appreciated Pascal's videos, he's our After Effects expert. Um, jump on here and buy the Polystein kit. Also, Polystein's become a bit of a phenomenon, hasn't it? And if you look at Polystein, um, just sharing my screen here still, you know, there, there's, you know, whatever, half a dozen Polystein kits stuff here. There's, you know, Tor Fricks, and here's one for Mesh Builders. and It's blown up, man. I can't believe how well he's done with that. It kind of makes me yeah. a little bit, it makes me a little bit green because, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> some of us, some of us put a lot of work into plugins, and then he goes and makes one little thing, and like, it explodes all over everything. So, you know you've made it when Blender starts copying you, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to copy it. But then yeah. you have an asset uh, system that's very useful as Blender. So. Yeah, we've got uh, Emmanuel, who's been um, helping us on the website at Pixel Fondue, is, is running the Polystein website, which I should have up here, actually, see if I can find it, where you're going to be able to, it's an asset collection site for Polystein. Um, parts, kit bashing, which is a rapidly becoming the go-to way of modeling for hard surface modeling. And uh, I'll get a link to that in the description as well. We'll put that up there. But uh, Emmanuel's been putting a lot of effort into that. And I think he's doing some kind of cool like auto update stuff and some sort of basically an asset, like an online live asset place for Polystein parts. And Polystein parts, by the way, aren't just for Polystein. They're, you know, they're mesh assets. You can use them for booleans. You can use them just for any sort of kit bashing. Um, they're polystyrene compatible, in fact, that they'll seamlessly weld with each other. But you can use them for anything, right, Pascal? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So these are general purpose assets, but uh, but also polystyrene compatible. So 
That's awesome. So what do we have? Uh, is the artist formerly known as Yzan still there? I can't tell because it's just a figure. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening, Yzan? You got anything new for us? Um, actually, uh, working on some uh, some kits, seeing if I can get something up. Um, r the rumor the rumor mill says maybe Pad Two might be back. Pad Two, you know? that was the preset kit from uh, one of the original preset kits from Moto back in the day. That was the original gangsters right there. Um, That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to tell because I mean, obviously uh, Richard's done some work in that field. Um, his is a bit more of a general pack. I'd like to see if the kind of focus on product and automotive um, might make sense. Um, currently, just kind of yeah, just kind of contacting the previous uh, customers in the same space is kind of figure out you know how are they still using it do they would you like the would they like an update what kind of things they'd like to see so just kind of getting a feel for what would be interesting for now and also checking in you know what kind of renders they're using obviously from uh way back then i think 2012 or 11 or maybe 11 i think yeah it was a while ago yeah it was a while ago. it was like six seven years um, you know, the, the landscape in the rendering space has changed. Uh, people have uh, multiple rendering, rendering uh, platforms today, you know, using Moto and V-Ray or Octane or Keyshot or whatever they are using. So kind of I want to make sure that if I'm uh, going after it, I understand, uh, you know, the, the community that's uh, currently available. If somebody on the uh, chat had asked if Redshift is coming to Moto, and I know there was some noise about that. I think they were doing Houdini for No, wait. Uh... Doing somebody else first, but they they had made a sort of a half-hearted commitment to it, so maybe another GPU renderer. But right. uh, yeah, Isan's right. So what's interesting, and Adam maybe speak to this a little bit from the CAD world. Um, this kit bash, not just kit bashing model parts, but the it used to be an asset uh, would be like a stock image. You download a texture, right? So you jump online, you get a texture, and it'd help you in your workflow, or maybe a preset or something like that. But we're rapidly becoming getting to the point in this industry where There'll be presets for everything: geometry, full-blown shaders, animation, uh, uh, you know, motion capture bits, everything, things like that. Camera setups, lighting setups, uh, like Kelvin at, at Adam says. There's assets for everything, and a workflow coming out of this is rapidly becoming having access to the right assets and having a workflow that allows you to pop these in seamlessly or easily and update them and browse them and everything else easily, this is a sort of workflow emerging. And you look at this 10 years from now, you look at something like, um, Adam, what's the what's the online CAD one? CAD share or? Uh, GrabCAD. Uh, GrabCAD, GrabCAD, um, which I'll often go to, which is which is you're more, you're gonna grab something like a SolidWorks file or something like that. But if you need like a robot arm or, not, or some, or a, a motor or something, Massive amount of geometry there. Yeah, not just. I mean, not just that. I just recently used it on a on a project, and literally within, uh, I want to say within half an hour, I was able to get something that looked photorealistic. Uh, in terms of just populating a, a kind of a desktop uh, view, between GrabCAD, which I use to grab mostly, like an iMac, iPad Pro. Uh, pencil, trackpad, keyboard, and uh, iPhone. I think all yeah, all Apple products, and some uh, like weird va like geometric vases and things like that. And then I went to CG Trader, who also have a bunch of free stuff that you can use like plants and things. And then to the asset site from Moto Community, uh, I grabbed a, a chair and some pencil holders. I mean, literally half an hour was able to populate an entire desktop with real, like real looking assets, um, which I had to model zero of. Yeah. And, and, and so workflows need to adapt to this, right? Yeah. I mean, what, the, the idea is I think quickly the because concept, this is what's happening. Correct. The concept of modeling has changed, right? It's like, uh, used to be where you had to model every single little tidbit and there's a lot of pride in kind of modeling everything. And I think that was awesome, but I think that's also changed now because there's a lot of, you know, CAD data that's, you know, that's accurate. You don't have to like replicate this using subdivision surface modeling. There's a lot of scan data that's also kind of more accurate than your scan modeling. data is going to come flooding in. Materials so the, are already there. Yeah, the concept of a modeler has changed in the same way that rendering, you know, has changed. It used to be like you had to be proficient in using traditional lighting techniques to fake global illumination and, and that create no your own longer, material. 
create right. your own materials, right? Yeah, even yeah, even that stuff, you know, with scanning and, and things of that nature, um, I think that's also changed. So it's it's kind of what's funny is that I think it's it's going to be going back to a traditional artist because now you're the photographer. Now you have to know more about lighting and composition than you have to know about the technical aspects of running 3D programs uh, and things of that nature. And I think it's a great opportunity for photographers to actually jump in because in this day and age, you're able to get this stuff done way easier than five or 10 years ago. Now, Pascal, you do a lot of pre type stuff in your work. Now, th yeah. this, the availability of a bunch of pre assets help, I'm sure, it makes your job easier doing pre -vis. Yeah? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to build... I mean, each company has sort of their own pipeline and their own their own assets, but they do you do you do need to have a huge library of things because you have to build like a kitchen and uh, in like half a day and be very precise because the clients always want something you don't have, so you have to be able to have assets that are customizable. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Exactly. And you can sort of pick your render. We just had a comment on the chat forum. Yazan asking, any any plans for a Slick 3? Something that's going to work with other renderers a little more seamlessly, like Octane. What? Or I know Adam has a lot of questions about Octane on his stuff. Uh, well, Slick 2 um, was updated to work with Octane. You just had to contact Paul, the plugin guy. And I think we we, we uh, he's able to provide you with the, we made the assets Octane uh, compatible. V-Ray, I haven't checked because I just don't use it and I don't know about it much. Right. Uh, whether a Slick 3 is in the works, that's a hard one to ask. So I have an idea of what I'd like it to do. I think it's way beyond what I'm able to do uh, with my hands. <laughs> um, uh, and I think there's a lot of other tools out there like HDRI Studio Pro and kind of Unless I do what I have in my mind, it'll be really hard to do something unique and valuable to the community. I, it's just copying additional features from other companies. I think that's just not what I do. Well, what about you, Adam? What about Kelvin? I know we had some questions you dealt with earlier with Kelvin and Octane. Some moto specific features may not be supported by a particular plugin like Octane or V-Ray. And, and how do you, I guess they just kind of come out of the woodwork and you try to address them one at a time, huh? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, because every every like the third party renderers are getting more and more popular, obviously for good reason. I mean, they all have their advantages. Um, I think uh, I tend to use the Moto renderer for the most part right now because for the kinds of scenes that I do, actually, I just did a head to head with Octane and it wasn't much faster. Like I would have to get a few more graphics cards to have it really make sense. And even then I've got a farm. So why wouldn't I just use a CPU farm? Like it just, it, for, for the way that I'm set up, it makes more sense. So all that is to say that the way that I'm focused as I build these things is I'm focused on the motor renderer. Um, and so um, what I'm doing now is like actually right now I've been chatting um, with uh, my developer on um, Render Monkey 3. As we build that out, one of the big priorities for that is third party renderer support um, for automation, you know, with that. And Kelvin as well, you know. Kelvin is set up to use to take advantage of Moto's features. I mean, that's that's the way it's it's built in Moto for Moto. So when right. you start using it with Octane or V-Ray, some of the tricks that I'm doing that work in Moto don't necessarily work in those packages. Just depends on how their how their integration works. So um, there are usually ways to make it work. We, in the email thread that I was just that, that Greg is referring to, we were able to fix the problem for the guy and make make Kelvin work well and in octane but um but yeah you just kind of have to know a little bit more to do that so ideally uh, with, oh go ahead adam no i was just going to say i mean with regard to the broader question about pre-made assets i mean it's just um it, it depends on what you're doing obviously but when people like when i go to do train like i've, I've gone to do week-long training sessions at design companies all over the country and when i do that they're like you know, they're asking me about these details about the shader tree and how do you build how do you build materials and how do you do this and, and that and i'm like what yeah, I mean, I, yes, Here's I could teach you to do that. Like, we could sit down and do a whole big thing on the Moto Shader Tree, but why? Like, you don't need to know that. That's yeah. a waste of your time. You yeah. should hire me to do it because I'm already good at it. Let's let's just let's just let's just do that. You hire me, I'll make it easy, and then you can drag and drop and do your job, which is what you know what you should be focused on, which is the actual CMF or c colors, materials, and finishes of your product. You know, and that just so I think I think in addition to convenience, um, it's also just a matter of like designation of roles within a within a process. You don't you don't need to reinvent everything nowadays. 
you, you don't need to do that. It, true, there is like Yasmin was saying earlier, like having as, access to assets does not necessarily make you a good artist. And so typically, like I've worked with a lot of CAD uh, or uh, a lot of product uh, manufacturers, they send me their product and somebody's already taken a stab at it in SolidWorks. <laughs> like they've already tried to do some renders. They obviously didn't work out. That's when they end up contacting somebody like Sabretooth and we go in and do it. But you know, having access you know, to a vast amount of materials and things like that, you shouldn't have to remake um, you know, a carbon fiber material every time. You should just be able to have 15 different ones you want to pick from. And I do think like workflows need to support this. When I'm in Photoshop and, I, and I'm picking a font, I type out what I want to pick, I keep it highlighted, and I hit the down arrow 4,000 times. And I find a font that I like. I'm browsing my assets live. If I polystyne or Boolean a vent into my mech, I just want to go dick, 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 that one. That's the vent I want. And then I move on. So there's a, 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 a workflow issue that needs to be addressed to catch up with this blossoming asset industry that's happening. There's been more, uh, you know, Luxology prior to the foundry um, was on to this early and they kind of dropped the ball, I think. They had a splash kit and they had a sort of a, as kind of a, like a, a sci fi kit where you could buy a kit full of splashes or full of um, you know, sci-fi parts like you know, vents and weapons and things like that. And they just kind of forgot about it. It was a great idea, but it, it just sort of went away. Well, since Polystyne was released, we've seen the release of literally hundreds, if not like a thousand different parts of assets, everything from plugs to faces to stuff like uh, Pascal is doing. Um, and shout out to Emmanuel who's building, a, who's building a website specifically for Polystyne stuff. Right, right, right. And, and so we have a vast amount of this stuff in addition to all these materials like Richard is releasing and everybody else. So, but there has to be a, a quicker way to iterate through these in, in the workflow. Same thing with materials. If I drop on a plastic material, I don't want to drag on a blue one, drag on, I just want to like dink, 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 dink. I just want to keep hitting the down arrow and having it update while I'm on there. It's faster, right? So we want to shave off as many corners as we want. Something along those lines. But I think that, um, it's crucial for uh, the content creation application to have workflows that support this way of working. That's my sermon. <laughs> In terms of assets, uh, of pitches, uh, I'm like Adam. I, I use Modo for the render, and uh, I don't. I've sort of looked at the various other options, Octane, Vray, all that, but I don't want to learn a new renderer. If I have to use to learn one, it would be a real-time renderer. And in terms of assets, if I saw that there's a, a Unreal uh, bridge now with Modo, which I haven't checked yet. But to me, building assets for real time, for my job especially, is, that's the new thing. I mean, I think the real time renderers are where the future is more than the CPU, GPU, or whatever. Yeah, that's a good. There's a good case for that. Absolutely. I, I'm really interested to see how the community around Unity Unreal um, sort of blossoms around Modo and other programs as as there's better integrations between these. A lot of people, like for me, I'm like, I do a number of Unity projects, but I'm always just creating assets for it. A full-blown engine is a little intimidating, I think, for even a 3D animator who, who is used to sophisticated software. So it's, it's, it's a, again, a time investment to dip your foot in there and see what's going on. But that seems to be the way of it, Pascal. I think you're right. Yeah, you see, you see those uh, ArcVis videos done in Unreal? They're just amazing. It's just like, it's yeah. I mean, some of it is baked in, but it's just, if More than some. I mean, it's it's a lot of work to do those things. They they are gorgeous, and they make everybody drool. But there's some smoke and mirrors going on there. You're not going to get into Unreal and all of a sudden have those gorgeous images. It's that's not how it works. Yeah, but it will in a few years. Okay. Yeah, in a few that. years, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So Mike, I mean, a good question would be what we can what can we do together to do stuff like that to make it easier? Because I think that would help everybody out. Yeah. Right, so I think we need some community feedback on that as we see these things, these features start to show up. Speaking of new things, there was a new ZBrush release that I think is very relevant and should be talked about. Um, Steve, you're a ZBrush guy. What are your immediate thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I just want to say as far as ZBrush goes, I, I think there's three kinds of users with ZBrush. There's people who love ZBrush. There's people that just think ZBrush is so alien that they will never ever pick it up. And then there's the ones that I think there's probably a few of here, or there are people that have ZBrush or you know have access to it and they think it's really alien, but they really want to know it. That's they, me. Yes. Got it sitting there for years. One of these days I'm gonna learn ZBrush. Um, 
So I was that user for a long time, um, probably the first few years I had ZBrush. And then I really just kind of, you just really have to kind of put a little time into it. Um, and, and now everything about it is just sort of second nature for me, you know? Um, so, you know, you really, there's really a hump to get over with ZBrush. Um, it's not like your typical program and you can kind of get rid of the 2.5 D aspect of it. And, you know, a lot of people just want to use ZBrush, get into it and just start sculpting. Um, and I think that that's probably an approach I'll take with the Pixel Fondue videos is I just like to kind of show people how to get into ZBrush and sort of ignore all the stuff that they don't really need to know and, and get into, you know, being productive with ZBrush. So, uh, but as far as the new release, um, you know, uh, live Booleans ha have been, um, you know, are yeah. really incredible. Um, you know, I, and obviously you can do live Booleans with, with Moto now with, you know, uh, with the procedural stack and all. Uh, but, you know, with ZBrush, you're talking about like pure concepting power. I mean, you know, millions of polygons, it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, it's just real time, you know, Booleans. So, uh, you know, things like uh, they have the... Well, they're doing uh, an interesting trick and what they're doing, uh, you know, they're they're creating a sort of render trick preview yeah, with the Booleans and then you calculate it at the end of the day, which is a really cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's a render boolean is pretty much what it is. Um, you know, until you actually convert it to, you know, to an actual ge ge geometric mesh. You know, so um, in that way, it's sort of like mesh fusion in that way, in that you know, you're you're really just having a preview mesh until you actually go to, you know, convert that to a. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's not too yeah. different in that way. So I did actually try to replicate the case fan that they used as the example on the, on the ZBrush uh, 4R8 rollout in Moto, and these are the type of things you can absolutely do in Moto. But again, it's there is a, there is a feedback advantage that ZBrush has, right. um, where it's very quick. Where you may have a control advantage in Moto with some of the things with filleting and, and some of the more procedural mesh operation issues you can do in Moto. But um, again, it's an, it's a way of working in ZBrush. Um, Weird interface or not uh, has has dominated the organic mesh creation industry for a number of years now, and they're they're kicking down the door for hard surface modeling too. So you can't yeah. ignore these guys any longer. You just gotta either pray they come up with an interface that you're, you like, like I've been doing it not fine. Just like forget it. You have to learn it again for like the fifth time. All right. Well, they're the only people out there, as far as I as far as I can think of, they're the only major player that's that's solely devoted to modeling. Right. I mean, they, they do really some texturing and stuff, but I mean, it's like everybody else is a DCC or, you know, so I, that was that's always been one of I think most of the people here at one point or another have complained about Moto's departure from that path, you know, many years ago and to become a general purpose tool instead of focusing on modeling. And um, and I think we've all suffered for it. I mean, and the fact that like uh, at this point in Moto, there's like the sculpting hasn't been touched in years. And I don't think that, you know, as far as I know, there's no plan to touch it anytime soon. So, you know, it's kind of, I, I think we're stuck with, with what we have in Moto, unfortunately. Well, no, give, give us some credit. They have introduced mesh operations in version 10. So they're, they're mesh, making- No, I didn't say no yeah. modeling, I said sculpting. Oh, sculpting. Now, mesh, op, mesh Ops is awesome. Mesh Ops is fantastic. And I'm using that actually, as we speak, I'm sitting here doing a project and uh, and using Mesh Ops and, and, and Mesh Fusion, which are both um, good technologies. I find them really, Irritating in some crucial ways, but um. well, here here's a thought about mesh operations and, and Moto. So Moto, if, if you're a long time Moto user, you know what the tool pipe is is essentially a tool to make a tool. So you're combining you know an action center and an access and an offset and a fall off and everything else to make a tool. Great idea. And mesh operations works in a similar way. You're a sort of snapshotting tool pipes and you're putting this into a, a a procedural package. You could jump back in and adjust. But sometimes, like what Adam is saying, is you get the feeling that instead of using a tool i'm making a tool <laughs> i'm using <mesh> <laughs> operations yeah you know like i want a general purpose tube tool where i can add a mesh operation then just start drawing a curve and then pick whatever profile i want from a library pick a procedural 2d shape a star or a ingon or a circle or whatever i want uh big add you know thicken it right there without having to add another mesh op or resample the curve without having to add another mesh op more of an artist tool, I, I, I know I could make that in Mesh Ops because I did. I made one and it was better than the standard Mesh Ops tool, but um, I want to see that come with Moto. I want to be able to just add an artist tool from the get go and not 
create a tool and then use it. If that makes sense. Yeah. That, well, I mean, I think I, I've so I've told I've said for a long time that Moto I don't even I don't even see it as a tool anymore. Like as a standalone tool, I see it as a as a platform. Um, and that in the same way that like if you come from the CAD world, like nobody uses Rhino the way it comes out of the box. Like Rhino by itself out of the box is a crappy tool. And and some people are gonna you know get real mad at me about that, but it's true. You try to model anything in Rhino by itself, vanilla Rhino. Like it's terrible, but no, nobody uses it that way. You buy a bunch of plugins, you get things configured the way that you want to using external stuff, and then all of a sudden you have a really capable tool. I feel like Moto is getting to be the same way, where at this point, you know, usability has kind of been thrown out the window in exchange for a lot of different power to do a lot of different things, and there are 10 million options to change every possible thing about the app to the point that nobody could possibly know all of it. Which is part of why I've spent so much time on things like Zen and whatever. And I know I feel I feel like I'm just plugging my stuff, but everybody here is doing the same thing. We're all creating. Uh, Polystein's a great example. We're all creating ways of working with Moto, and like letting like <laughs> building workflows in Moto so that people don't have to learn the broader program, so that you can just kind of focus on your work. Um, and I think that that's really what these things come down to. Like, and we're seeing this in other apps too, by the way. I mean, lots of people are doing this, these sort of add-on workflows for Maya and Lightwave and whatever else, where you're not, if you're using the vanilla tool, it, things are kind of clunky and all over the place, but you get the right plugins installed, you get the right stuff set up, then suddenly things can be really streamlined. Well, I think Blender is actually the best example of that. Um, this is a community <laughs> that will jump on any interesting new technology uh, and iterate on it and pop it in the program in a very short uh, amount of time. I don't think people typically use Blender for vanilla Blender. They use it for all the cool stuff that has evolved out of the ecosystem. And it's a great place to look. Like I was teasing William when Blender started, uh, we started having Polystein sort of clone show up over in Blender. Hey man, it's a modeling arms race, you know? Respond, we'll see what you got. We'll see what Polystein 2 can do. And that helps everybody. Um, speaking of Moto, we should talk Moto 11.1, I believe was released today, yeah? Correct me, is that right, Steve? It was, yeah. That's right. Uh, so that is out today. Let me just screen share that. So 11.1, so we had 11.0 was the initial 11 release. 11.1 is the second iteration. We can expect an 11.2 within the same window of maintenance or uh, subscription, right? Maybe not an 11.3, but so uh, we've got some things here. We have got the Unreal Bridge, with pa which Pascal mentioned. Uh, haven't used that yet myself. I'm just gonna sort of drag through here. I've tried it. I haven't used it a lot in production at all. Uh, the Unreal Bridge? Yeah. Okay, so we've got, I, I noticed there's been quite a few new UV uh, tools coming out. And I think that's one thing that you still, there is still is no magic UV button. It's gotten better, but UVing is still a laborious uh, part of um, modeling, especially for game asset creation. We have to do a lot of packing and stuff. So it's nice to see Moto still improving its UV tools. Yeah? yeah I've been using the UV tools a lot, actually. Um, and a few of the new enhancements are really nice. Um, you know, like the box tool to sort of gives you a bounding box around your UV island and, you know, you can kind of move it or snap it in place or anything. Uh, that's really like the, the one thing that I'm kind of annoyed about is that they removed, they seem to remove the, you know, before you could stitch um, a UV island to another one, you know, by selecting edges and it would show you the unhighlight, you know, the highlighted edges on another island. Right. Uh, now they took the option to either move it to the selected Mm -hmm. Island or the unselected one, so now it just sort of moves it to you know in, in a place, and so you can't really. Uh, oh, they took away the option to yes, put one or the other. The option to move it to either the unselected edge or the selected edge. So now you're you know because I want to keep my you know I, I might even already move my island into place, and now I you know so now it just moves it into you know sort of I think averages maybe, um, and so you, then you get your your island at an angle and you know we uh, really have to lobby for that to come back <laughs> yeah, so i'm uh, kind of complaining about that one new uv to svg svg seems to be rapidly replacing uh, illustrator 8.0 files as the uh, uh structured drawing standard thank you for that uh, that is good advanced viewport is on you telling me you have a problem with this image <laughs> <laughs> i've got i mean Whatever. It's uh. It's not, <laughs> the, Azan's got 99 <laughs> problems. That image ain't one. All right. Yeah. Let's jump over to Pixel Fondue. Let's uh, check out this image by Tor Frick here. This is a sweet mech from I don't know if anybody saw <laughs> Tor's uh, mech modeling marathon. Perhaps something like this would be a good model for 
for that, maybe you think maybe it's something a little so. shinier. I mean, to be well, to be honest, I mean the advanced viewport has so much potential. Uh, first of all, I, I haven't checked the the changes they've had in a, in, a, in a bit, but I think you know rendering is moving to that. At least initial you know approval renderings and, and previews have should or will be uh, the real time uh, rendering and no longer just doing the uh, full rendering engine ray trace, even the GPU stuff. Um, I think the real-time stuff can convey a lot of what you want it to do directly there. So, you know, show an image that does that. That specific one does not do a good job for me. Yeah. But the image before it, you know, that looked sexy. That looked nice. Uh, I'd, I'd keep that one in there. Well, this is John Knowles. I'm sharing my screen here. John Knowles' channel chip video. That's the advanced viewport. That's yeah, Star Wars that. corridor. Put, put that. Put that! No, maybe you can't. Star Wars. They have Star Wars stuff all over the site, man. He's put put it that. Out there now. Just Some just... tank. Come on. All right. Yeah, Tanks are people. so 1990s, man. I just, I know Richard's gonna kill me, but whatever. Yeah, they're putting up, putting a lot of work in the advanced viewport. I, I think that's a good uh, use of development time. I think that's gonna be, uh, hopefully, uh, will continue to improve. Um, what else do we got with uh, Moto 11.1? We have. I know they put a lot of effort into uh, Olympic I.O. So that should be improved. I, I, I did some early testing on that. I got to jump back on there. But you should be able to do particles and simulations more, um, which I think is a better idea. I think like being a, having a good Olympic I.O. Uh, workflow, so you can use a program like Aduni or Maya to do your particle and, and simulation work and bring that into Moto. If that's like Adam has said, it's your platform for processing data and, and spitting out going to a renderer or whatever else. Uh, I think that's a good idea to put some time into that. Not sexy, maybe, but I think Olympic is, is the best we have in terms of a scene format, right? Asking for confirmation here, right? All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. Better out of box experience. So I've got all kinds of opinions on that, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> I think there's some good stuff in that video. Um, if you haven't watched the better out of box experience one, there's some good stuff in there. Uh, it, it, like really simple, basic stuff, but, but stuff I've wanted for a long time, like the ability to see. I don't know, Moto files in the preset browser. You can see them now. And nice. also, you can change them to uh, an L instead of LXO, you change it to LXT, and it becomes a template file. So when you open it, then it's in a new untitled document, something really? that we've wanted since like 1995. So, so you open an LXT, you'll say this again, I didn't know this. So if the uh, extension instead of LXO is LXT, when you open it, it's gonna it's gonna open as an as a as an untitled document, yeah. Untitled document. Okay, so it's basically importing it. Yeah, right. Um, but I mean, and and a lot of us have been doing that for years. Um, like I do that in Kelvin, right now. Um, I, but I do it using a hack because I've had to work around the fact that they didn't have that, and now they do, which actually I I'm pretty excited about. So. Nice. Okay. All right, we got some preview updates. So anyway, it's it seems like a. Um, a bread and butter kind of release, right? I guess the Unreal Bridge, if you're into that, is is a bigger is is, is going to be a big deal. Um, but eleven, it seems to be just sort of a bread and butter, faster, more stable, uh, you know, sort of release, which I think is great, and I think people in the community have appreciated that. I do think uh, when Moto twelve comes out, people are going to be looking for some innovation. Yes, hopefully, I think so. Yeah. I'm just looking for a better user experience. Can user experience. I'll take that. I'll take that take over that. all the features that are in there right now. Or it seems like, added. It seems like eleven dot one has a lot of um, like smaller features that are just geared towards making your, your life a little bit easier. Like even for mesh fusion, there's a cut, copy, paste, and split uh, feature, which is really great. It just uh, it, it just speeds things up. It allows you to basically create multiple fusion items from uh, the fusion source meshes and the uh, and a single uh, fusion item. So it's it's just a it's like a workflow. It's actually like a, a really powerful thing, but it's, it's it seems small on the surface. But when you start using it, it's really really helpful to have. Right, right. Yeah, Mesh Fusion has been getting a lot of work with every release, and I think there's going to be some pretty great stuff uh, coming out with Mesh Fusion. So keep your eye on that, and which is good because it's, especially with the sort of workflows we've been talking about. Um, all right, Moto Eleven. Anything else on that? This is a round table after all. I don't know. Alex, what are your thoughts over there? <laughs> well, uh, one thing that isn't is explicitly listed on the page is uh, just the overall stability and performance improvements that have been really uh, pushed Spilling, forward right? since the you know, zero. Yeah, stability and, and performance improvements. I agree. I think a lot of people 
um, have been asking for that and you're getting it and they're willing to like throw in their maintenance uh, fee for better stability and performance. And, and definitely there's some uh, performance improvements with um, work with multiple items and, and some things like that. And, and they're, they're committed, it seems to be getting better performance improvements for deformation animation and, and some other things. So that is going on. Um, Anything else in the world of 3D? I know Algorithmic had released a new had their new release a few days ago. I saw Wes, uh, Pixel Bondu contributor, had put out some great videos on Substance Painter, and they've got the new Steve. Can you describe their new sort of uh, uh, release schedule they're doing over here? Yeah. Um, so for the most part, now they've gone to sort of a versioning. Um, before, you know, you bought a version, you. You know, you either bought the India license or, you know, you bought a professional license. Uh, you know, and that depended on your amount of revenue you generated. So now they have, um, uh, I don't think that's changed, but as far as like the actual, you now have, it's sort of a subscription plan. Um, right. And so now you buy it and it's not, it's not a regular subscription where you, you know, once the subscription runs out, you don't have the software anymore. Um, you have basically whatever version you're, you know, you're up to. And they go to a certain date. So I think like my version of Painter might go till like September this year. Uh, and then I would have to, you know, re-up for another year or whatever. Um, but I'll still have my Painter. And then the designer, I think, is sometime through next year. And I think it's the same for everybody. So it's not like Moto where, you know, you bought in at March 1st. And so, you know, your next version, you know, starts at March 1st next year or whatever, um, your, your, your subscription. So, um, but it's very, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, I like it. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's a good move. And it's also, they have the subscription to, you know, you, uh, you rent to own basically. So mm -hmm. you know, you're renting a, a permanent license of, you know, of your, you know, your and they have, they have this massive asset library now, the substance database, oh, yeah. uh, substance <laughs> source, which yeah. kind of goes into what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And now that the, uh, the source uh, library is now actually a part of Substance Painter, so uh, you can actually pull that up, you know, from the interface. And when you download something, it goes right into your shelf. So you know you can use that asset right away. As before, you had to kind of install it into Substance Painter sort of manually. Um, now you can actually just download it right in the application, which is really handy. Yeah, I thought Wes did a really nice video on that. I watched that the other day. Yeah. On, uh, on YouTube, and uh, yeah, this is going we're talking about. I think I'd like to do a subst a CAD rendering video using nothing but substance source materials, and see how that see how that pans out. But uh, it's not just for game assets; they've got some good materials on here for everyday sort of clean uh, clean material use. Um, okay, we got that. I think we're maybe getting kind of covered here. Anything else going on that you guys want to talk about? Yazan and I have some really cool stuff going on that uh, we can't tell you anything about, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so something to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. Ba basically, I spent like the whole morning uh, talking to Yazan, and the whole day yesterday, and the whole day before that. So if that tells you anything, we've 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 been at the very least wasting a lot of time talking to each other. Um, and uh, and we'll see we'll see where that goes. There there'll definitely be something to announce. I'm hoping I'm hoping in the next uh, next month or so, um, something to show you guys should be pretty cool. All right. Sounds good. New exercise video maybe. Yeah, that's exactly, you know what? Damn it! What? How does everybody figure this out? Uh, you you guys are doing an exercise video. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Mouse up. Mouse oh, yeah. Mouse up. Uh, all right. Yeah, it's all based on uh, it's exercise videos based on injuries that you got from uh, working on computer. So <laughs> right, no it's, using it's your RSI. No using uh, back. Workout video. So, Yep, yep. Yeah. Oh, somebody on the chat mentioned a nuke face capture <laughs> thing. And there's actually like a nuke. There's other some other nuke, crazy nuke uh, plug in there that does some uh, auto, auto tracking, right? Oh, yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have the, uh, the uh, web page to show for that. But yeah, I could, we could look that. Uh, yeah, right. Google nuke face capture thingy. Super crazy. <laughs> Go find it. Yeah, I thought that was. Why is that nuke? Why shouldn't that, that should be Moto, right? No. They're making yeah. geometry there, yeah. right? Yeah, the uh, dude's got a pretty good uh, space. Going on on stuff. Okay. And then the motion capture area. We do a simple oh. camera. So like this face shift also for uh, face shift sorry, for uh, Maya. Uh huh. Works oh, facial facial capture, face shift. Yeah. <laughs> I am waiting desperately for affordable facial capture and uh, basically good motion capture. 
be a, essentially an Xbox depth sensor or something like that. I think really once that gets out, look out. I mean, Is anybody actually a good topic to talk about? Have you guys seen the AR kit stuff on uh, Twitter? Anybody following that kind of stuff? Apple AR kit? Yep. And with the, the measurer? Well, not just the measure. I've seen so many nice implementations. It just really opens up the the floodgates for what you can do. Again, it's like pre-made content. You know, in the next uh, couple of months when this thing gets wrapped up, uh, people are going to be looking for content, and not just any kind of content, but animated content and smart content. And I think the implementation of the AR kit, AR kit is pretty brilliant because you can interact with these things. Uh, the measuring thing I've seen, uh, there's a me like you can actually measure distances in the AR kit uh, without having to have the, uh, the, the you know a ruler with you. I've seen one doing uh, speed and uh, measurements in there, uh, but more, more than that, it's just you know you visualizing products in their own space, visualizing your a new car in your garage if that's how you buy cars, visualizing uh, you know speakers in your living room. Well, what's interesting um, is I think instead of deal. using uh, uh, goggles for a visualizing device, you just hold up your pad or your phone or whatever, that's their display. You already you already own one, you don't need to buy like a headset, right? That's yeah, kind of the breakthrough that's, to that's me. The, I mean, that's the point. I mean, what's funny is that they what they've said is actually pretty true. Overnight, um, once Apple gets, you know, releases its thing, it's basically the biggest AR platform out there. Not necessarily because it's the best technology or whatever, but it's because it's available for every single person that's got an iPhone. Right. Yeah, I read that the IKEA is actually going to have an app where you can see you can see the furniture directly in your own apartment. Before you buy. Exactly. I know. And, uh, and the thing is, IKEA, I think, has a really great department that's really streamlined for these kinds of things. But I can imagine every single manufacturer out there that wants an AR version of their product is going to be looking for uh, and, and 3D artists to get their assets in there. It's an opportunity to make some money. Yep, and they're probably going to have to use some sort of baking thing to get those assets out there and with textures and lighting. And um, I think diving into the AR kit is definitely the thing to do f for art, for 3D uh, peeps these days. So the geometry has to be optimized enough to be handled by an iPad or an iPhone, correct? I mean, it is 3D it geometry. Do it does have to, but you'd be surprised about what it can handle currently. So um, it can do a lot already. Right. Okay, so AR, you know, if anybody's interested in, in doing an, uh, like a Moto to AR or, or 3D uh, app to AR tutorial, let me know at a Pixel Fundu, contact at pixelfundu.com. We'll put it up there. Maybe we'll try to jump on this um, because if Apple's throwing some weight behind this, it, it could be a thing. Oh, it's definitely oh, it's, oh, a thing. Oh, it's a thing. <laughs> 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 All right. Cool. Okay. I think we're good. Anything else? We're coming up on our hour, I think. Uh, I was just going to mention one other thing. Um, a while back, I covered the uh, the OD copy paste plugin. Um, it's a little Python script that Oliver Hotz wrote that will allow you to copy geometry from one 3D application into the other. Um, so I just I just wanted to mention that he recently just added a support for both ZBrush and Substance Painter. So now, if you have an asset in Moto, you can just copy it and then jump over to Substance Painter and paste it right in and you know, and start working on it. So it's a uh, it's a really handy tool. You know, it saves you having to save assets, load them. You know, import them, import them, all that. So yeah, it's a it's a really cool little revolutionary tool. So right. So yeah, we got uh, this is the uh, tutorial Steve did, and yeah, just being able to throw some geometry over to ZBrush or Substance is is super useful. It's, it's yeah. Great. I think the uh, the Substance Painter one is, is sort of one way, so you, you know you wouldn't copy something from Substance Painter and, and take it out. But uh, as far as just getting your asset in there, um, you just you know it just gives you a paste button inside of Substance Painter, so you can paste whatever's in your in your text file, you know, buffer. So cool, cool, yeah. All right. All right. Anything, Anything else? else? I, we are, I hear my feedback. Who's got their headphones off? Who is it? Um, uh, I think that's about it for this Pixel Fun Do Roundtable. You know, two chats over. Ed, sign us off. No, I got nothing. I guess uh, I'll just see you next month, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to put up more. Uh, there's, a, there's like a, I have a backlog of Mesh Fusion uh, tutorials that I really want to uh, record. So uh, look forward to that because I'm gonna have a lot more time to work on this. So, All right. You know. All right. We are out of here. See you guys next month, and I'll get this up online shortly. Thanks a lot, everybody. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.
right? 